another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Ambition Perilous. I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Ambition is a very powerful stimulant, a powerful urge driving men upward toward better things. Unless, of course, it's so strong that it drives them on to evil things. That's the aspect that Fred Conrad forgot about. Fred was ambitious, very much so. And his great hopes had carried him far. He was the most popular district attorney in a long time. And now he had his eye on the governor's chair. And the prospects look good for the coming election. But they'd look even better, explained Art Moran, his campaign manager... If Fred agreed to Moran's great new idea. I tell you, it was a brainstorm, Fred, and it'll be a political masterstroke. The voters will eat it up. Fred Conrad, the great humanitarian, the champion of the underdog. Why, they'll vote for you in droves. It'll be a Now, thing. wait a minute, wait a minute. Stop rhapsodizing and tell me what it is. Look, it, it came to me as I was going to bed last night. I just heard the news that the governor had issued a pardon for Max Fenton. Yes, yeah, so what? So what, he says. Remember Max Fenton, the guy who was sentenced to life for a sensational love killing ten years ago? Of course I remember him. I convicted him. That's the point. That's just the point. Don't you see? It's great. Convicting Max Fenton was your first big triumph as a punk assistant DA, right? Right. Now, the governor, your political opponent, pardons him. So, what do you do? Issue a blast against the pardon? No, 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 no. You give Fenton a job. A job? That's right. You meet him, shake hands with him, welcome him back into society, and give him a job. A helping hand. Get it? You take him under your wing. Oh, it'll be terrific. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That would mean I'd be siding with the governor, approving his pardon. Not necessarily. You don't have to prove fully. I got your statement all worked out. Besides, sometimes it pays to jump the fence a little. Yes, but suppose Fenton doesn't go straight. Supposing it doesn't work. That's the beauty of it. Let the governor worry about that. It's his baby. He issued the pardon. Hmm. Well, ah, now, don't you worry about a thing. I've worked everything out. Talked to the parole board this morning. Got the arrangements all made. Here's the statement. You look at it while I find uh, the not, 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 not yet, now. Well, I read it. Okay. While I cannot agree with Governor Dawes on the wisdom of pardoning Max Fenton, a convicted murderer, the decision has been made, and I, as a good citizen, will abide by it. Hmm. Furthermore, I believe it my duty to give whatever assistance I am able to Fenton in his readjustment to the society to which he has paid his debt. Therefore, I have decided to employ Fenton in my home and to offer him every opportunity of once again becoming a useful member of the community. Hmm. <laughs> How do you like it? Not bad. Not bad. I'll do it. <laughs> Well, that's very decent of you, isn't it, Fred Conrad? That is, it would be if you were doing it for a sincere motive, but you aren't. No, it's only your selfish interest you have at heart. Even when you meet Fenton at the gate and shake hands with him and he thanks you with tears in his eyes. Even then, it's the newspaper photographer you're watching. And you're thinking about the stories that will appear. Noble decision. The human side of Fred Conrad, district attorney. Editorials lauding you to the sky. You're thinking of Governor Dawes up at the State House, who's wondering what's behind it, getting nervous about your new political popularity. It all comes true, of course. The newspaper is the governor. But publicity can attract attention lots of places, Fred Conrad, places you'd forgotten about. For instance, at the bar of the Club Sam Moritz. Hi, you Millie. What'll it be? Make it the same, Barney, but double. Double? Coming up, bourbon straight. Thanks. Something bothering you, Millie? Why? 
Why do you ask that? Just curious. You never ordered the double before. Oh. Yeah. Something's bothering me. Now, that ain't right. A good-looking doll like you. A swell singer. You knocked him with that last number. That guy down at the end of the bar there, for instance. He sat there with his mouth hanging open like he hadn't seen a good-looking woman in years. Yeah? Hmm? He's not bad himself. If you like the type. Any way he likes yours, he should have been staring at you. Know who he is? No, you want us to find out? You know better than that. The boss blows his top if I got guys hanging around here. Okay. Fill it up again, Barney. You mean another double? That's right. Yeah. yeah you really are stolen. You want to tell old Barney about it? It might help. It might. Barney, did you ever hate a person so bad that all you wanted to do was hurt them? Somehow, anyway, hurt them. Well, no, I don't... Well, I have. They eat you up inside. But you don't do anything. You keep it all inside it. And one day, this person does something. And he's a big hero. Talk of the town. Great guy. Maybe he'll get elected to something. You wouldn't mean Conrad, would I'm not you? saying who I mean. But he's no hero, and I can prove it. He's a heel. Suddenly, all this you got inside, you have to bust loose. You feel like you got to get it out, get your revenge, or else. What are you going to do, Millie? I'm not sure yet, Barney. But I got a feeling that a certain hero in this town is going to be sorry I'm alive before very long. <laughs> Now, back to the whistler. Frederick Conrad, public benefactor, great humanitarian. Too bad that opinion isn't shared by everyone. Of course, one person couldn't keep you out of the governor's chair. Or could she? Better get a grip on yourself, Fred Conrad, while you sit at your desk talking to Mrs. Christie, your housekeeper, as she cleans the room. Yes, sir. It's as certain as I'm here in this room, you'll be in the governor's mansion in two months. Well, thank you, Mrs. Christie, but... Well, we'll take things as they come, eh? <laughs> and believe me, those who've helped me, stood by me through the lean years, won't be forgotten. The little people who've served so faithfully, like you, Mrs. Christie. Oh, if that isn't just like you, Mr. Conrad, always thinking of others before yourself. Land sakes, you're always doing someone a good turn. All those prodigies, for instance, like Mr. Simpson. Uh, protégés, Mrs. Christie. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. <laughs> well, that's just my little hobby. You might call me a speculator. I invest in people, and the dividends are well worth it. Hmm, probably one of your investments to make another touch. Are you in? Yes. And uh, before you open the door, get rid of that dust mop, will you please? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to meet you, Conrad. Just a minute, and I'll ask if he'll see you. And Mr. Conrad, it's a young lady. Never mind announcing me. You'll see me, all right. Well, I never. Hello, Mr. Conrad. Remember me? Millie. It's Millie, all right. And I'm no ghost. Mind if I sit down? Oh, no, no, no. Please do. Good Lord. This isn't possible. <laughs> all right, put your eyes back in. I told you I'm no ghost. I'm little Millie, Mildred's daughter. Remember me, Uncle Fred? Li little Millie? Mildred's little girl? Well, of course, Millicent. Yes, Millicent. Now that we've got that settled, suppose you close the door. I'm here to talk business. Well, well, oh, of course, of course. Uh, you may go, Mrs. Christie. Yes. Well, now, where have you been keeping yourself? Uh, did, did you say something about talking business? Yes. And I don't like Snoopy housekeepers. There. The whole thing. There. Well, my friend, you've done all right for yourself now. District attorney, next governor. At least I know you won't be satisfied until you are. You seem to know me pretty well. I ought to. 
Do you think I've forgotten what you did to my mother? Shh, you please, killed please. her. Just as surely as you'd stuck a knife in her heart. Millie. She committed suicide because of you. Yes, Governor. I know the real Fred Conrad. And I've got an idea there are a few other people in this state who might like to know the Fred Conrad I know. That... That letter in your hand. Looks familiar, doesn't it? Ah, ah, ah. Hands off. I've managed to keep this nice and clean ever since Mother died. I don't want to get it all smudged up. But I just wanted to compare you it. You want to compare the stationery to that letter on your desk? Oh, no wonder you look scared. Still using the same personal stationery, same letterhead, Frederick Conrad. Same thick gold engraving. I hope you're smart enough now not to write love letters on that paper. What are you getting at? Ever hear of a smear campaign? Sometimes it takes a lot of big guys with a lot of pressure to blot out someone's career. And sometimes it just takes a girl with a letter or two. You're threatening me with blackmail. My mother was a rich widow. You took her for every cent she had. You were going to invest it for her. But I was. Could I help that her? That wasn't enough. Go... You told her you loved her, promised to marry her. I've got a complete record of your crooked, worthless promises in the letter I've got. Even when she had a chance to marry someone else, you ruined that. Listen to this. My darling, I must see you before you take this rash step. You know I love you, and I don't intend to let anyone come between us. Please... Stop! Make... I don't want to hear any more. That was the night she jumped in the water at Cypress Point. Nobody ever knew you were there that night. Except me. How much do you want for that letter? Well, let's say $30,000. Isn't that about what you took from Mother? Are you out of your mind? I don't have that much money in the world. Okay, I'll take it on the installment plan. And we'll start with 5000 by next Wednesday. Oh, you cheap little blackmailer. Cheap is hardly the word. I think you'll find me rather expensive before I'm through with you. Wait. Who's there? Hey, Mr. Conrad, I brought the car. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you had company. It's all right, Max. Well, what's the matter with you two? Huh? I'm sorry. Well, hello. I remember you. You were at the bar at the Samaritz the other night. Yes, I, I suppose I should apologize for staring as I did. Huh? You two know each other? Well, not really. You might introduce us, Uncle Fred. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, Millicent, this is Max Fenton. Not the Max Fenton. Yes. Yeah. I'd better be going now. I just brought the car around. Well, it's all right, Max. I won't be needing it. You can go. No, wait. I was just going... If you don't mind, Uncle Fred, Mr. Fenton can drive me home. Oh, yes, uh, if he's not busy. No, I'd be very happy to. Good. Then we can go right now. But, Millie... Our business is all finished. I'm sure we understand each other, don't we, Uncle Fred? And I'm sure you'll make the necessary arrangements by, shall we say, tomorrow night. <laughs> Fred Conrad, the road to the governor's chair looks a little harder than it did a few minutes ago, doesn't it? It's going to be a little more costly than you figure. You've got the first 5000 and you pay it. But then in two weeks, Millie wants another installment, another 5000 This time you need help, and you get it. From Moran, your campaign manager. But the campaign fund won't spend too much, Fred. Moran has to account for that money. And he says as much the next time. When you're trying to raise the third installment, another 5000 No, no, now look, Fred. I can't do it. Five grand don't grow around on three. And they're getting plenty strict about campaign expenses. How am I going to account for it? I don't care how you account for it. But I've got to have it. It's important. Plenty important. You still don't want to tell me what it's for? No, I don't. Then I'll tell you. You're playing the sucker for a canary. Don't, not, don't try to deny it. I've been checking up. This singer from the club, St. Marie. She's been coming out to your house to see you. She's been banking big money, put two and two together. You had no right to go snooping into my business. Your business? It's my business, too. I'm in this campaign up to my neck. And I don't intend to see you play sucker for a dame like that. Now, look, I'm not playing sucker for any dame. What are you calling? Dame. Paying big dough to the girlfriend while she makes eyes at another guy, an ex-con. Your own gardener. Fenton? Yeah, Fenton. He's the apple of her eye. You mean Millie is going around with Max Fenton? Sure, behind your back. You'll be the laughing stock of the town if it ever gets out. That's why I'm telling you, Fred. There's no more money. Hurry. You better brush that dame off fast, or I'm through. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I better hand. Now, Fred, what's going through your mind? 
When Moran told you about Millie and Fenton, a great idea burst in your mind, didn't it? A great idea. But wait, Mr. District Attorney. You're thinking about murder. Murder, Fred Conrad. You know all about that. You know what happens to murderers. You've sent them there many times yourself. So if you're going in for anything like that, you'll have to be careful. Plenty careful. Set it up carefully, Fred. Well, Max, you certainly have the green thumb. The roses haven't bloomed like this in years. Just what I've been telling them, Mr. Conrad. Would you look at this basket of Cecil Bruner's? My, aren't they beautiful? Mm. Where'd you learn so much about flowers, Max? I took care of the garden. You know where. Oh, yes. Yes, I see. We'll have to hurry if you want some of the zinnias, Mrs. Christie. It won't be light much longer. <laughs> Why, it'll be light for another two hours. But you hurry, Max. Now, Mr. Conrad, it'll take him a good two hours to get cleaned up for his date tonight. How'd you know I had a date? <laughs> oh, I may be dumb, but I'm not blind and deep. Neither is Mr. Conrad. <laughs> That's right, Max. Oh, now, don't look so sheepish, man. You've got a fine girl in Millie. And a mighty good looker. Yes, sir. There are plenty of young swains who'll testify to that. What do you mean by that? Well, Max, I do believe you're jealous. Just look at his face, Mr. Conrad. A regular thunder. Give me that basket. I'll get you thinning. My land sakes, the man must be chilly in the head to get so upset over a little thing like that. Oh, I was a fool to make that remark. Not at all. It wasn't your fault. The man is just crazy jealous, that's all. You're right, Mrs. Christie. It, it's very obvious. I just hope I haven't made a mistake. Why, what do you mean, Mr. Conrad? Oh, nothing except, uh, you, uh, remember why Max Fenton went to prison. Why, yes, it was... Yes. Yeah. He killed his girlfriend in a jealous rage. Oh, no. I only hope I haven't made a mistake. Nicely planted, Fred. Mrs. Christie will remember that later, won't she? The rest of the plan is taking shape in your mind, too. It's so simple. Max Fenton once killed a girl he loved in a fit of jealous rage. Why can't he do it again? Of course, it's too much to expect that you could drive him to it. But it wouldn't be hard to make people believe it if Millie were found dead, would it? Not hard at all. Of course, that means that you personally must do the job. But, well, ambition has carried you far, Fred, and you're not going to give it up now. No, not Fred Conrad. Now all you have to do is set up the scene. And Max Fenton helps you with that when he comes in to apologize. I just wanted to apologize for that scene in the garden, Mr. Conrad. I don't know what came over me. I guess I acted pretty stupid. Oh, don't worry about it, Max. A man isn't responsible for anything in this heat. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. It's just... It's just that when a man's gone through it, I have. His past just won't let him be. I guess sometimes I'm afraid of myself. Does that sound crazy to you? No, it doesn't, Max. But you've got to exercise some control over yourself, man. Snap out of these neurotic fears. You're a free man. You've paid for your crime. Face the future with courage. You'll need it. What do you mean? Just this. Unless you're prepared to face things as they are, you're licked. Men will always be attracted to beautiful girls. And just because you've fallen in love with one, you can't keep her like Peter's wife locked in a pumpkin shell. Oh, I know it. Unless. Unless what? Unless you just take the bull by the horns and ask her to marry you. That should end it once and for all. You'd be married and you could be sure. How... Yes, you're right. I've wanted to. But do you think I should? I mean, after all I've been through, I... Of course, man. Now, look. You call her right up. Make a date to see her tonight. Take her to some quiet, secluded spot and ask her and get it over with. By golly, Mr. Conrad, you're a brick. You make me feel like a new man. I'll do it. I'll go out and get the engagement ring and make a date to meet her at Cypress Point tonight after she gets off work. Thanks, Mr. Conrad. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Yes, thanks, Fred Conrad, for setting everything up so well. If Max Fenton only knew how well. It's going just the way you planned. You wait long enough for Max to have made his call. Then you put in one to the same number. Hello? Hello, Millie. Are you alone? Of course I'm alone. Who's this? It's Fred Conrad. Listen, I'll have that money for you tonight. Well, tonight? 
besides, only Monday's not due to Wednesday. But you don't understand. I'll have all of it. So what? I... Hey, you mean the whole amount? Yes. I had a pretty hard time raising it, but I'll have it all for you tonight. Well, it'll keep till Wednesday. I've got an important date. Tonight. I know all about your important date, but this needn't interfere. I'm not keeping that much cash on me any longer than I have to. I'll get it to you tonight, and you see that you have those letters. Look, I told you, I can't... What meet... time is Max meeting you at Cypress Point? 11.30. I'll be there at 11. I'll give you the money and get the letters and be gone in 10 minutes. Say, what are you trying to pull? The setup sounds phony to me. I'm getting fed up with this business, Millie. And wash my hands of it once and for all. Either you'll agree to my proposal, or we'll just forget the whole thing. You can go ahead and carry out your threat. At this point, I'm beyond caring. Okay, okay. Skip the dramatics. Meet you tonight at 11. See that you're on time. I will be. And see that you remember to bring those letters. So far, so good. The plan is thoroughly formulated in Fred's precise legal mind. And as the time for action approaches, he carefully reviews each step in the plot. By 10.30, Mrs. Christie will be asleep. He can slip out without her ever knowing. The trip by automobile will take 20 minutes each way. And the lethal business to be transacted at Cypress Point, 10 or 15 minutes. The whole job done in less than an hour. And as for evidence, Fred permits himself a satisfied smile at this thought. Any number of people can bear witness to the fact that Sam and Millie had been meeting at Cypress Point. Mrs. Christie, for one. Yes, it will be an open and shut case. That's what Fred keeps telling himself as he makes his last-minute preparations before getting the car out of the garage. He stuffs the envelope with paper. That's all he'll need for the final payment. Everything's set now, Fred. So you drive out to the point in exactly 20 minutes, park carefully behind a row of shrubs, and climb up the incline to the little park overlooking the water. It's very quiet and lonely-looking. There doesn't seem to be anyone here. Until suddenly you see her. Lying on the ground. Millie! Good Lord! She... She's dead! Yes, Fred, there lies Millie, dead. And the thoughts go whirling through your mind. It's even better than you'd planned. Max Fenton had done the job for you, probably in a jealous rage. Maybe Millie refused to marry him. Somehow you don't stop to wonder about the fact that Max wasn't due until 11.30. But you should have, Fred. But now it's too late. Your thoughts are rudely interrupted. Yeah, she said, Uncle Fred. Max! What have you done? That shouldn't interest you so much as what I'm going to do. Max, no! No, stop! You're in... Max! What are you doing, Max? <laughs> Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Fred Conrad, it didn't turn out the way you planned, did it? And as you gasped out your last breath, you still didn't know why. You didn't reckon on several important things, Fred. One, that love is impatient. That Max Fenton, anxious to meet his future wife and give her the engagement ring, had arrived early at the point. But why had he killed her then? You might have had the answer to that if you could have seen the letter he held in his hand as he walked away from the point to give himself up to the police. A letter he didn't give Millie a chance to explain. It was a letter on your stationery in your handwriting. Your letter, Fred. My darling, I must see you before you take this rash step. You know, I love you. I don't intend to let anyone come between us. Please meet me at Cypress Point tonight. Just for a few minutes. I know we can straighten everything out. You are loving a friend. Yes, sir. The letter you wrote Millie's mother long ago. The letter you were going to buy back with murder. The irony of it was you wouldn't have had to. You see, Millie was in love, too. She decided you'd suffered enough. Her revenge was complete. 
She intended to give the letters back to you tonight and keep the 10000 she already had as a wedding present from you to her and Max Fenton. Too bad, Fred. It might have worked out so well. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Harriet Ray, music by Wilbur Hatch. This is Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.